one of the really amazing things about having this much heat is that it teaches you very quickly to slow down. <laughs> to take your time. To remember to hydrate or drink some fluids or to find some shade to stay out of the direct sunlight. Because in over 100 degrees, you get burned very quickly. You wind up dehydrating. You wind up having no moisture content to your body because it evaporates. It's gone out of your system. And when you start getting really dehydrated, it kind of thickens up your blood. And then when you're trying to think in the process of your brain trying to work, you wind up being kind of fuzzy little muddled, not quite a hundred percent. That happens to Christians a lot. You see, sometimes when you think that you can just get along or get by without having to study or to read the Word of God, being that it's considered the living waters, that that's what the Word of God is called. It's called need and it's called other things, but it's also called the water of the Word. And so when you get dehydrated, you get a little befuddled, you get a little dizzy, you get a little off kilter. And when you do, it's easy to be provoked. Because most people, if you've noticed, when it's really hot, they get angry really easy. They get provoked. They can stumble and fall and lose their peace or dis disavow themselves from knowing the joy of the Lord because after all it is In the spiritual realm, when pressure comes on and you find yourself in trials and tribulations that seem to frustrate you in some way, whether it be from the Christian or the ungodly, there's always some friction going on. And whenever you see that friction, you have to be careful because if you're, quite frankly, dehydrated, if you're not full of the Word of God, if you haven't really studied and applied yourself to knowing God's Word, then what happens is that friction is caused because you have two very dry things that are striking each other. They're very hard surfaces, so they spark and they arc. And if there's kindling around or if there's anything that's flammable that could wind up being, you know, kind of like provoked, then what happens is as soon as that spark hits, poof, there's a fire raging inside you and you're all of a sudden mad for no reason. You're angry. You're reactive and not proactive. You're not acting on the Word of God. You're reacting to the circumstances of life. One of the things as a mature, born and Christian we're called to do is to be involved in conflict. We're supposed to go to the conflict. As a matter of fact, we are the peacemakers. We're the ones who bring in the reality of the Word. You see, if you had two striking surfaces, let's just say that you had two rocks here and they were striking each other, and you'd see sparks flying. Let me ask you, if you were striking those rocks and you drown them in water, what happens when two rocks strike each other underwater? Well, nothing can happen. They can't spark, can they? They may kind of like rub each other, but even the rocks can't hit as hard because they're moving through the water. They can't quite hit as hard or impact as much because they're underwater. Unless they're moving at a quite you know, rapid pace, but by that time the word or the water would be moving with it. So, one of the things that I learned was that the Proverbs teach that love covers a multitude of sins. And often people that are striking each other or mad at each other are, quite frankly, you know, in sin in some way because they're not in the word. They're not doing what God told them to do. They're causing conflict of some kind. So when you find yourself in these kinds of conflicts, think of it as drowning it with love. You see, if you drown a situation, no matter what it may be, if you just bury it in love, the proper teaches love covers a multitude of sins. So if it was underwater or under so much love that it couldn't 
function except to float, as we know that a lot of rocks are a lot lighter when they're underwater. Even you, you float when you're underwater. Well then, likewise, in our Christian walk, if we would drown a situation with love, and you might find that there's an answer to every man for a reason for the hope that lies within you, and that the scriptures would be true that love covers a multitude of sins, because, quite frankly, love can take care of 90% of the issues that most people, men and women of God, face. Love does that. It's not just a question of how you feel about it. It's a question of what you do with it. Because love is an outward expression of God in you. That's what love is. God is love. And as God expresses himself through you, the manifestation of that is love. You see, you can't say that God is manifesting himself through your violence because God is not violent. He can handle it himself. He could decreate it as much as he could create it. He could wipe it out with a word. Even as Jesus stood up in the boat and said, Be still. Peace. So, the reality of who God is in us, Emmanuel, coming out of us in our actions, should be manifested through love. Because if it's not, everything else is really matters of the flesh. So I was thinking, you know, when I sinned today, you know, and I have, you know, I quite frankly, you know, given five minutes, you know, I could sin in ten, you know. <laughs> Matter of fact, I could probably ruin, ruin anybody's salvation in 15 minutes. Just kidding, it's a joke. But no, really, when I found myself in sin, you know, I, I repented. I said, Lord, you know, this is disgusting, you know, please forgive me, you know. But God, don't just forgive me, but cover it under a multitude of your grace, but a multitude of ways that you love me, so that it's so buried deep that I don't think about it anymore and that it doesn't cause conflict with other people around me. So that way it's buried under the love you have for your people as well as for the world. Because God, in ministry when I sin, it affects so many people. Could you not love me again and just continually love me as I ask forgiveness for my sin? And God does, you know, and he, he appreciates my creative ways of trying to get out from under the consequences of sin. Because <laughs> I'm like you. You know, sin's one thing, Lord, but you know the consequences are a real mother. <laughs> no, I don't want to pay for it, Lord. I just want to get away with it. Yeah, it don't work that way. <laughs> just like you, i got to pay for it too. Oops. Oh well. And it affects me, you know, throughout the day. And by tomorrow, you know, God will have removed it far from me, the stain. And Satan will quit accusing me, you know, and we'll move on to grace, you know, more of grace. Because where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. But in my life, I was thinking about, you know, forgiveness and mercy, you know, thinking about the cost that it was to Jesus. And, you know, one of the teachings I had when I was a young man was that, you know, every time you sin, you crucify the Lord again. Well, at some point in time, that's not true. But, you know, <laughs> it's a nice thought when you first start off because it makes you feel bad. But, you know, the one thing I noticed about me was that, you know, they say that men don't cry, you know, and there used to be that old joke about men don't cry, and then later on we got to where men do cry, and then we got to where men cry too much. Well, I like to watch Christian movies, and often I watch, you know, all the different movies that, you know, have Jesus' life and story in it, and by the time we get to the crucifixion, it doesn't matter which show I watch, by the time we're watching the crucifixion, I'm crying. I cried at Jesus Christ Superstar. Now, that's pretty weird. I cried at Godspell. That's kind of different. You know, I cried at King of Kings, the black and white version, and King of Kings, the color version. You know, blue eye, blonde hair. But I, I do. It just, it grips me, you know, in my heart somehow that I don't know, I never knew really completely what it was that made me cry so much. And then I read in Tozer, a long time ago, and we're reading it today, what it should represent for me. And I realized that in my spirit, yeah, I got it the first time that I ever saw Jesus die. And I realized that you know, he didn't die as a penalty, but he died for me. And it just, every time I see that, knowing that he's dying for me, it just, it, it just overwhelms me that I can't, I can't contain myself. And I think when you learn that for yourself, 
and you begin to realize that you really do hate sin. You know, you hate really the fact that it does feel good or whatever it is that you may have done, you know, to a degree it feels good, some sin, but you hate the fact that Jesus died for you to remove that from you because that is what it costs God in order for us to be forgiven. The glory of the cross, atonement and forgiveness. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Isaiah 53, 4. Never make any mistake about this. The suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross was not punitive. It was not for himself and not for the punishment of anything that he himself had done. That's not why he died and why he was on the cross. The suffering of Jesus was corrective, not punitive. He was willing to suffer in order that he might correct us and perfect us. He wasn't going to accept us as we are. He was going to remove us from ourselves that we might become likened unto him. Brethren, that is the glory of the cross. That is why we take up our cross daily to follow him. That is why we are crucified on our own cross to be like him. That is the glory of the kind of sacrifice that was for so long in the heart of God. That is the glory of the kind of atonement that allows a repentant sinner to come into peaceful and gracious fellowship with his God and his creator. It began in his wounds and ended in our purification. The painful and acute conviction that accompanies repentance may well subside and a sense of peace and cleansing come, but even the holiest of justified men will think back over his part in the wounding and chastisement of the only begotten Son of God, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. A sense of shock will still come over him. A sense of wonder will still remain. Wonder what that the lamb that was wounded should turn his wounds into the cleansing and forgiveness of one who wounded him. That in those very actions with which Jesus died and was crucified, it was for me and loving me to change me and to make me into the man that I've become and the man he wants me to become more like himself. It is because of that that each and every man of God at some point in time should come to the realization that the knowledge of the cross and the, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ himself making atonement for our sins to restore us into a right relationship with God and to open up the doors of forgiveness that we should receive it by way of grace being bestowed upon us should cause us to love God more than we've ever loved anyone else before. Because no one else has ever laid down their life like Jesus has and did for you. No one else would reach out even from that moment and look upon those who were crucifying him, you and I, because that's why he died. You crucified him as well as I. And then to look us right in the eye and say, Father, forgive them. They know 